1, verse 16 through 18. I've been coming to this church for now 16 years, and in those 16 years, I've grown to love you guys a lot. And so one of the first things that, that I, I want to tell you guys is, it's kind of random, but it goes with the text, and I want you guys to, to know that you're my beloved church, and I don't want you to be deceived by online scams. You see, uh, one, of, one of the biggest scams that happens is online scams. Another one is phone scams, and they steal millions of dollars from people every day. One of the things that has happened to even some people at this church is they might call you up, and, and when you pick up the phone, they'll say, oh, hi, Grandma, hi, Grandpa, and then you'll just believe, oh, this is my grandson, this is my, this is my granddaughter. And they'll say, hey, how are you? And you'll talk for a while, you'll think you're talking to someone you know, and then they'll say, hey, listen, I need some help with money. And they'll ask you for your information, and you'll give it to them, and there's a scam there, and they'll take all of it. They'll take all of your money. And it's terrible. And it's through this deception. The same thing happens online through a variety of all kinds of different ways. You'll think you played the lotto in Nigeria. What? And people go and they send, oh, yes, I did play the lotto in Nigeria. I can win all this money. And they give all of their information. And they do that also with McDonald's. Oh, if you send us all your information, we'll even give you McDonald's credit card. What? the randomest scams, but they do this so that they could take your money, and so I, I need to tell you something, and it has to do with deception, and, and it has to do with trials, because we've been reading about trials for the last few uh, weeks, maybe even a couple months now, and I want to first review a couple things, but the main thing here is that when there's trials, we're very prone to deception. When there's trials, we're very prone to question God. And so today, the title of today's message is Combating Deception While Under These Trials. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word, Lord, and thank you so much for your truths, God. Lord, I thank you for being sovereign. I thank you for giving us the strength to just go through these trials and for even the gifts of, of trials, God, and for what they do, Lord. I ask that you bring perseverance and steadfastness, God, so that we can receive the crown of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. So let's read the text. Verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Verse 18. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now, Let's go back and look at some of the things that Andrew has talked about with the book of James. The book of James is written to a very unique church. You see, these people are very Jewish. This, this is only being written to a church that is anywhere between seven years to 20 years between, or I'm sorry, right after the crucifixion of Christ. So this isn't like a church that's now filled with Cubans and Haitians and all kinds of people here in South Florida. This is a very, very Jewish church in Jerusalem. This is a church that knows all of the Jewish history that has happened between the Jews being taken captive in Assyria, the Jews being taken captive in Babylon, in Persia, and in Rome. They know all the stuff that's going on and they've been oppressed for all of these years. And the reason I want to talk about the Jewish people here is because one of the things that the Jewish people would do daily and nightly is they would pray something called the Shema, the Shema prayer. Before they lie down and before they get, and, and after they rise up, they'd pray the Shema prayer. And if you put the Shema prayer up there, you could see what it says. It says, Hear Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. That's just the beginning of the Shema prayer. But it brings us to understand that when we are praying, it's not always us asking of God to do things, but sometimes it's God just letting us know who he is. See, he wants us to pray this prayer, not because when we pray, here, when this happens, here, Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. I mean, I'm not asking God anything here. I'm not, not doing anything. There's not something like that happening except for the fact that God is reminding his people, here, O Israel, the Lord is one. So why this, con this constant repetition? Why did the Jews have to go through this repetition every single day? Well, we need to know God. That's the first thing that we need to know when we're going through trials so that we will not be deceived. 
If we do not know God, especially in this time period in which James is writing to this Jewish church with all of the Greco-Roman philosophies and ideas that are going around, they're very prone to deception. This is the same time period in which the very Jews are persecuting the Christian Jews. And they're saying, no, Jesus is not the Messiah. And all, the, all these questions are being thrown around. And when trials start happening, you see, you know why you're going through this stuff? You're going through all of these trials because you are not obeying God. You're going through all these trials because you are living in sin. Jesus isn't the Messiah. We're Jewish. What are you doing? So don't be deceived. We need to remember that the Lord is God. The Lord is one. And he's been the same exact God from the beginning to the end. He has not changed. There is no variation. There is no shadow. There is no shifting shadow. He's not confusing us. He's not changing us around and trying to get us to go astray. No, he's the same God, and he's teaching the same message, and Jesus Christ is a huge part of it. It's what he's been trying to show us the whole entire time. So how, do we, how, do, how does knowing God help us? Well, through reading his word, we definitely get to know him better, and it's not this one and done, oh, let's read the Bible, read it, done, I know what Christianity is all about, now I know God, I'm good, trials are easy. No, no, no. It's also through the repetitions. Repetitions are crucially important to us. Now, this doesn't mean heaping up empty phrases like Jesus talks about in Matthew 6. These are repetitions that are important, and it's not just like I said, like the Gentiles may sit there and, and, and say these things to God and feel good about themselves. No, no. This is us reminding us of who, or, or God reminding us of who he is as we go into his presence so that we can know him and know what he's all about. Some of these repetitions like that is also within the Lord's Prayer. If you go to Matthew 6, verse 9 through 13, it's on the board there, you'll see that it says, Pray then like this, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is happening there when we pray that prayer? Are we asking for something? Is is something going to change? Oh, God's will isn't going to be done if we don't pray this prayer? Is he not holy if we don't pray this prayer? No, he is holy. This is God reminding us of who he is. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's him reminding us that it's not our will be done, it's his will be done. So whatever we're about to pray, it's his will. It's not ours. Our repetitions must be deeply biblical. Um, Recently, this, this last week, on Wednesday night after church ended with the youth group, we decided we were just going to end up singing hymns. It just happened. Nathan Johns walks in, he starts playing these hymns, and we're trying to sing hymns, and the youth group gets together, and we were terrible, absolutely terrible. We couldn't keep up with the hymns. We didn't know how the tempo went. We didn't know what the words were going to say next, and it was, it was just embarrassing. And, I, and then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, you know what? Well, here, here's something. And I grabbed a song. I was like, oh, let's see if we could play this one. And it was very simple. And uh, as we went to start singing it, it was, it was just the simplest song it was ever be. And the, na- and the song isn't a bad song. But all it said, the chorus, the only part we remembered was, your praise will ever be on our lips. Your praise will ever be on our lips. And he just said that over and over and over again. And we, pra- and we played that song and it was like, yes, we got it. Sounds good. Then I thought about it and I was, you know, I was, I was kind of saddened because the only thing that we were able to remember how to sing because of our repetitions of this one song that we used to play so often was that your praise will ever be on our lips. And it was this implied your, who's this you? What's the point of this praise? What's going on here? Why am I praising? Why is it on my lips? And there wasn't a deepness to it. Our repetitions need to be deep. Because imagine if I was in a trial, imagine that I didn't have PowerPoint to sing a hymn. Imagine that I didn't have these things, and now I'm trying to praise God. I'm trying to be reminded of who he is, so I don't think he's a shifting shadow, so I'm not deceived during these trials, and I need to be reminded of who God is at this moment when these things are going through my mind, and I'm questioning God so that I, so that I can be strengthened, so that I can receive the steadfastness that leads to the crown of life. And I can't remember anything because of those songs. So our repetitions have to be deeply biblical. We have to have the word of God memorized. It will strengthen us. If you look at the armor of God in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, you will also see one of, the, one of these little things, if you could turn to it there on the PowerPoint. It says, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of, of righteousness. So you, go, see, you see this word there, which is the word of God? We're going to get to that. And, uh, and as shoes of, for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith 
with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now that word there is the spoken word of God. If you look at what that word is in the Greek, that word is specifically used as an utterance. It's a spoken word of God. It's something that we do when we sing hymns and deep repetitions. It's something that we do when we literally are going through trials and we quote scripture. See, knowing God, one of those things that we have to do is we have to speak this. What is the sort of truth? It's the word of God. It's the actual utterance of the word of God. Now, some of the, the things that we need to understand is that we're all prone to deception. Every single one of us. We're all prone to it. We are all prone to deception in this current state. And believers going through trials are vulnerable to spiritual con artists. Just like the con artists that you might see online. We're all prone to spiritual con artists. And when deception comes, it comes in many forms. It'll lead to questioning God. If he is what he's claimed to be, then, uh, then, then my trials shouldn't be this way. Otherwise, he isn't real. You see, you're directed to other people in the world who are living in sin and living in all kinds of different ways for themselves, and they're going through no trials. It's going great for them. And you think to yourself, man, if God is real, then, and I'm one of his children, then why is this going on to me? If God is real, why is it that other people are being blessed and I'm not? I've been obedient. I cannot believe that God is doing this to me. Either he's not powerful enough to get me out of this trial, or he is not good. And you begin to question his goodness. Either he's not powerful enough in my trial, or he is not good. And if you take that bait, you will not persevere in your trials. If you take that bait, like the bait that we were talking about last week with Ben's sermon, if you take that bait that's lured right in front of you and you start to believe that God is not good, then you will not persevere during these trials. The complexity of prayer. Much of, of the stuff that we're talking about has to do with the complexity of prayer as well. You see, I can't do a whole sermon on prayer because we'd be here for weeks, okay? But one of these things that we need to understand is that when we go to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Many times we think that, oh, I can go into prayer and I can ask God for whatever I want and perhaps I can change his will to, to then what I want him to do and then the future will be changed. And that's not true. Many times prayer is us aligning ourselves to God's will, not God aligning himself to our will. George Mueller has this great example. He says, it's, it's almost as if, imagine a man, imagine Ben on a little boat. And imagine Ben is on this little boat and he casts out and he's hooked something and he's pulling really hard on this little boat. And he's, he's like, wow, I'm making progress. I'm getting closer. I must have a fish. And he keeps getting closer and closer on this boat. And then his, his line goes down and he's stuck. Well, what happened to Ben there? Well, Ben hooked an object. And rather than the object coming closer to him and to his will, he was getting closer to that object. When we pray, what God is sometimes doing, many times, is he's aligning our will to his. Not that we are changing his sovereign will to ours. If you look at Exodus 32, you can see the way that Moses does this right after the people had sinned in his intercession with God. The second thing that we need to do is understand his gifts. We need to understand that every gift, every good gift, and every perfect gift is from above. Every gift that we see in life that is good needs to be traced back to God immediately. It's not coming from any other source but God. Good gifts are, in fact, from God. And all of those things must trace back to God. You see, Moses in Exodus 33, right after he intercedes in his prayer, what we see is that Moses prays a different prayer. Now he's praying to God and, he's, and, and God is saying, hey, you know what? I'm gonna give you my blessings. You're not gonna be going through any trials and stuff like that. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna pour my blessings on you. And one of the gifts that Moses receives from this is he prays to God and he says, no God, I don't just want your blessings. God, I'm not gonna go into the promised land without you. I'm not gonna move if, if you don't come with me, Lord. It's not gonna be worth it. 
This life isn't worth it without his presence. If, if there's nothing about God in this life and all we're doing is trying to enjoy the short amount of time we have here, then it's worthless. All it is is just a little bit of fun. Is that all it is? No, no, without God's presence, there's no point to this stuff. Matthew 5, verse 2 through 11, we have here the Beatitudes. If you turn to the Beatitudes, I asked my students all the time in, in class, hey, and I would, ask, I would ask them at the beginning of the year, hey, let's, let's list blessings. What do you guys think a blessed person is? And they would start naming, oh, somebody, somebody who's rich. Oh, okay, or somebody who's rich. Oh, somebody, somebody who's got a, a big loving family. Okay, that's good, loving family. Oh, somebody who, you know, he, he, he's, he, he looks good or he's, he's talented. He plays sports. He's a good singer. Those are, all the, those are all blessings. And then we read through the Beatitudes and we see blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Hold up. These gifts aren't always what we're expecting them to be. See, why is it that God blesses us with these, these things like meek? Why is he blessed to be meek? I don't want to be blessed to be poor in spirit. That means that I've lost something. I don't want to be mourning. That means I've lost something. I don't want to be meek because then that means I have to be put through some kind of trial to understand that it's not my will and I have to just align myself to God's will. I don't want to have to do those things. But all good gifts come from above. And so what is the good gift that he teaches us through our meekness, through our poorness in spirit, through our mourning? You see, when we come to a place in which we need God, we finally understand that his presence is much better than his gifts, than, his, than just the earthly blessings. When we finally understand that his presence is the only thing that can actually be a need in our life, then that's a true blessing. You see, if God blessed us just like many other people and we had these lives in which we didn't have trials going on and everything was good and dandy and fine and we never thought about God, that would not be a blessing, that would be deception. We would be easily deceived in a comfy prison bed all of our lives of ourselves and die never knowing God and that is not a blessing. See, many people will get deceived every day into thinking, oh, it's about me, I'm gonna live the funnest life and I'm not gonna think about God until a trial comes and they're able to see clearly that they need him. It's the trials that help us see when we're at our lowest point how much we need God and we can't do it by ourselves. That's the whole thing with the rich man not being able to inherit, the, for it to be hard for him to inherit the kingdom of heaven because all of his life he's fixed all of his own problems. He has money, he has the ability to do it. He's created himself to be his own God. He doesn't need God, he doesn't need to pray for food. So why is it blessed to be poor in spirit? Why is it blessed to be mourning? Because you're praying for things that you absolutely need God for your health. Why is it that when you are having to pray about your health, you absolutely pray to God more than you ever have? Because there's nothing that you can do. You can't throw enough money at your body until it's healthy. You need God. You need to pray. You're wondering how you're going to get your food? Well, you've got to pray. The rich man doesn't have to go through those things if he's filled with just blessings. No, the blessings, the greatest blessings we could ever have is his, pre is his presence. And Moses understood that when he's praying to God, God, I don't want your blessings. I don't want any of that stuff if I don't have your presence. Why would I want that? This life would be worthless. I'd be spending all my life just distracted. 70 years, 60 years, 50 years, for what? For what if I don't have you, God? I'm thirsty for you, Lord. That's what I want. I know you, and that's what I want, because I know you. If we don't know God, when these trials come, we will be deceived into thinking, how dare you, God? It's my will. It's what I want, and I've been so good to you, and I've obeyed you, and now when these trials are happening, I cannot believe you, God. You are not good, or you are not powerful. No, God, you are good, and I need you. Now turn to God and realize that the blessing and the gift of him granting you with his presence as you ask and need him. And before you know it, you're growing in him more than you ever have. You're not just distracted by your, what you've always desired of yourself. No, you have him. You're depending on him. Understanding his gifts, we see uh, also, if you look at uh, Isaiah 44, 22 through 28. Now this is, a, this is kind of long, but it, it is good. And I want us to, to read this because the Jewish people also knew this. If we can have that on the board, it'd be awesome. Okay, let's just turn to it. Isaiah 44, verse 22. 
verse 22. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like a mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O deaths of the earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains, O forest, and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of liars and makes fools of diviners, who turns wise men back and makes their knowledge foolish, who confirms the word of his servant and fulfills the counsel of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited, and of the cities of Judah, they shall be built. And I will raise up their ruins, who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall fulfill all my purpose, saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built, and of the temple, your foundation shall be laid. If you notice, if you've ever read the book of Isaiah, I remember when I read it as a kid and I was like, I don't get it. I don't know what this book's really about. But if you read the book of Isaiah, you're going to see a lot of these, these, these verses like, I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. I am the Lord, repeatedly. I am the one who got you out of Egypt. I am the one who did this. Is, is, is God just this weirdly like, hmm, I want you to notice me? No, he's not doing that. God's not, he doesn't need us. He, he's self-sufficient. It's not like the Greek Roman gods that of this time period who, who James is talking to, these people that know that, oh, if we don't pray to the Greek and Roman gods and make sacrifices, they become weaker. He's not needing that. God doesn't need any of that. Why is he reminding us of this stuff? Because as the people of Israel go through trials, he reminds them of who he is. He reminds them constantly of who he is because they are so prone to the deception when they are going through these trials. So as he reminds them, I am the Lord who made all things, it's not like some weird guy who's just sitting around like, I took out the trash, everyone. I cleaned the dishes, everyone. He's not doing that. He wants you, as you're reading this, to know who he is so that when the trials come, you will not be deceived. But another thing that I want to point out with this, with this passage is this little mention of Cyrus. You see, at the beginning, when I went over the review of who the people of Israel were, we saw all of these different kingdoms. And the kingdom of Persia was one of the kingdoms that God raised up in his perfect sovereignty as a gift for the people of Israel to return them back. And Cyrus was part of God's plan who God raised up to use as a gift for Israel. Now, Israel could have easily complained and said, God, we're still not free. But it was still God's will and his perfect gift to use Cyrus to bring them back to build the temple. Everything that goes on in our lives is a part of his goodness and his blessings. And we must trace all of those things right back to God. Even the mere, the mere morals that we have, when people do good things, when people gift to other people and people are good, we have to realize we are made in the image of God, and those good things are only there because this person is a reflection of God's character. Everything needs to be traced back to God. The last gift that I want to talk about here, which is one of the greatest gifts, and, and I, I want to read it really quick. It says, every good gift and perfect gift is from above. But here we then, uh, you skip a little bit, and it says, of his own will, he brought us forth. Of his own will, God brings us forth. And that brought us forth is used right before, which we talked about in the last sermon, but it's used in a way of brought forth out of the womb. If you study where brought forth is used, it's used eight times throughout all of Scripture, and every time that's used, those two words like that, brought forth has to do with, do with being born. Being born, being, being brought forth out of a womb in some way. And it says that out of his own will, he brought us forth. The gift, the free gift of salvation is all God's. He's the one who gives it to us. It's not of any works that, that we come and say, oh no, you see, I studied many religions and I read about all of these different religions and I came to the understanding and with my education that I knew that Jesus Christ could only be the true God and that he is the only way. No, no, no. Even salvation, the very salvation that we have in Christ, we can't take credit for it. We can't take credit for any bit of it. It's all a free gift of God. It's not a payment from God. It's not a reward from God. 
It's not like God says, oh, you know what, you have kind of looked at me and you've been good and you said you're sorry and because of everything that you did, I will give you salvation. No, no, no. That whole thing, God working throughout your whole entire salvation is all fully his gift. So when we look at things like if one is deceived during trials, the testing of their faith will not produce steadfastness. They will not receive the crown of life like you have on your notes there. If you are deceived and the testing of your faith will then not produce steadfastness, they will not receive the crown of life being salvation. God is doing all of that. Through our justification, when we first become Christians and we first get to know him, it's all God's work there. He's fully the one saving us. It's not by anything in which I tried to do, oh, I went, I got baptized, and then God, you know, because I did that, he's gonna save me. No, 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 it's all him finding us. We're dead. We have, we're dead. He saves us. He brings us forth. He brought us forth, that rebirth being there, that regeneration that he's teaching there. Out of his own will, he brought us forth. He is the reason we're born again in Christ. It's him. It's all him. This free gift, it's a gift. You can't buy it. He gave it to you of his own will. But also, not just our justification, but our sanctification as we go through these trials, as we grow in Christ in our relationship with God, as we continue to live the Christian life through our ups and downs, he is faithful even though we might be faithless. The whole entire time, it's all him. It's a gift the whole entire time. The steadfastness, that's a gift through his trials where he is interworking our sanctification. Fully God. Finally, we have to live as a sacrifice. One of the things that will happen to people when they're going through trials is they start to have this entitlement personality and they'll start feeling entitled to God's gifts because they've been obedient or because they've lived a life of wisdom and they've maybe sought counsel all their lives and then bad things happen to them and they question God because they feel entitled to his gifts and his blessings. Well, hold up, it's a gift you don't work for this. This isn't his payment because you've been such a good person, because you've been so wise and obedient. No, no, no. This is all his gift. So we must live as a sacrifice. We must realize whatever God gives us, your will be done, God, not our will be done, God. Your will be done. When we pray that, it's him reminding us. It's his will. We are just a sacrifice to God. If we are within his fold, if we are a part of his sheep, then we have to sacrifice everything, even our desires and the things that we might want in the future. Even those things, it's God's. God, your will be done. Lord, I would love that, Lord, if you could grant me this, Lord. Please, Lord, I ask that you heal this. Please, Lord, I ask that you bless us with this. But your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, because we know that if you are a good God, the best thing that you can give to us is salvation. The best thing would be my sanctification and my growth and your presence, God. So don't give me these things if it's gonna cause me to lose your presence, God. I don't want to lose you. God, don't bless me with stuff like that if it's not your ultimate will for my life and my salvation, God. I don't want it. I want your presence. Living life as a sacrifice, um, we see that, that here in this verse says that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That we should be a kind of first fruits. First fruits is used in three different ways. The first one is the first fruits of every time we receive income. So every single time that the people of Israel would grow crops, and, and I, I love that, that, that it's an agricultural first fruits because if you think about it, it's not just like giving up money and still having food around. Like, this was your food. The people of Israel, when they would be in this agricultural society and they would grow up their first fruits, which God commanded them in Deuteronomy 26, hey, give up your first fruits because it's all God's. It was God reminding the people, hey, you're going to eat, okay, and just trust me. Give your first fruits. I want you to trust me and to live this life by faith and sacrifice. So this first fruits is a concept of a sacrifice being given. And he wanted that because it showed their love and their trust in God and it grew their faith as they did that. The second thing that first fruits can also mean as James is, is talking to the church of Jerusalem here is these first fruits can be the people who are first coming to Christ. 
okay? So these, these apostles and this early church, this Jewish church coming to Christ can be considered the first fruits of God. But the other thing is it can be the first fruit of our eventual glorification. Our glorification is what one day when we die, we won't have to be in these, in these bodies that are dying from the day we're born and we have this set amount of years and it gets harder as we get older. See, if, if, you, if you get your finger, you look at your finger if you're young. If, if, okay, I'll talk to my youth. I want you to get your finger and I want you to pinch just the top knuckle right there and just watch it as it goes back. Now, if, if you're above 20 years old, it's probably going to take a couple seconds. It's going to take about three or four seconds to go back. If you're above 30 years old, it might, it might come back by the time we're, we're worshiping again, okay? And if you're, if you're above 70, don't do it. It's going to stay, all right? But that's testimony. That's testimony that our bodies are changing, and, and it's not about this life, and this life is one day going to end. And so listen to the fact that if you don't have his presence in your life, your life is one day going to end. It's life or death. You have him or you don't, and you're going to be with him or you're not. Are you going to have his presence in eternity or are you going to die and not have him? And are you going to live in eternity in hell? Are you going to be punished for your sins or are you going to receive the gift of salvation? Is that, is that going to be a part of your life? Are you going to receive the gift of salvation? Surrender your life as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship, church. Your spiritual act of worship is surrendering your life. It's being a sacrifice, a holy sacrifice to God. So when these trials come, if we are living as holy sacrifices, if we look at our lives and we live as a sacrifice every day and we die to ourselves, like Galatians 2.20 was, was, was um, just mentioned, if we pick up our cross daily, we realize that we have died, we no longer live, but Christ lives, then when bad things happen, we say, it's okay, God's the one who's, in, who's living. It's his will. It's not my will. I'm not mad at God. He is still good. The ultimate gift is salvation. So the first fruits here is the gift of salvation that after we are grown and we are sanctified, we eventually die and we never sin again in Christ. So being glorified is one of those first fruits and one of those amazing gifts that comes as a result of God first justifying us, and that is the first fruit there. Glorification is the first fruits not only by importance but also chronologically because, yes, when we become Christians, that is the first step that now we are with Christ. And one day when we die and the new earth comes and we are with Christ forever and eternity, that's the first fruit of God's will there in our lives, our salvation. So my challenge to you guys is, therefore, my brothers, live as a sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. If you live a life and you start to feel entitled, if you live a life in which you are not surrender, surrendering to God, if you live a life in which your repetitions are weak or you don't do them and you do not know God, then you will not understand his gifts and you will not persevere and you will not receive the crown of life. And ultimately, God is going to be sovereign fully throughout that whole process in your sanctification and gifting you the whole time if you are within his fold. But I have to warn you, do not be deceived, my beloved Sheridan Hills. Do not be deceived. For if you are deceived, you will not receive that crown of life. You must endure through the steadfastness. You must receive that in order to get the crown of life. And that comes through trials, and that comes through surrendering every day. And sometimes God is going to use those things that you never thought you felt entitled to. You never thought that it would have been this. And it was this perfect gift that he's repeated. Once again, he says, every perfect gift is going to be perfect for your life to remind you that you need his presence. So when these trials come and you're sitting there and you're having to pray and you're having to know God and be reminded of who he is because that's how hard this trial is. When you're going through those things, you can only persevere, you can only remain steadfast if you know God and you live as a sacrifice surrendered to his will. The beginning of the book of James starts off with the word do loss. It says slave. If you look at James 1.1, 1, 1, turn to it and look at the way he says it. He says, greetings, 
James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ. But James, a servant, in the ESV it translates as servant. Other translations for that word doulos truly means that doulos is a slave. It's the same way that Paul talks about himself as a slave for Christ. A slave does not have entitlements. A slave does not believe that it is his will. He has to submit to the will of his master. We must understand the word doulos. We must understand that we are just slaves of Christ when we are in him. That when we actually die to ourselves, we don't come up out of that water and it's just this little tradition that we do and we continue living our lives the same. We die to that life. We're born and now we live as Christ lived. We live a life to the will of the Father. Um, As the band begins to come up, I want to share with you a, a, small, um, a small little story. And I, and I take this from Ravi Zacharias, and it's one of my favorite things that he's ever said, and it's this Middle Eastern um, fable. There's a man, and I share this a lot, especially in Bible class when I was teaching it, but it helps answer the question of what is God doing? Why does bad things happen? How could a good God in my life allow these trials? How could he still be good and all-powerful and still allow this? You see, a man... There's a picture there of an Arab man with a boy and a horse. A man had a boy, and he loved this young boy, and he had one horse. He wasn't very rich, and he had this neighbor. And if you've ever seen um, Tool Time with Tim the Tool Man Taylor, if you've ever seen that, you you know that the neighbor comes up over the fence, and he comes over the fence, and he he always gives some wisdom or speaks to Tim. And and I want you to imagine that that man has a neighbor. So that man with the son and the horse is, is outside one day, and the horse runs away. And the neighbor comes over when he sees the horse is missing. He goes, well, Tim, looks like you got bad luck. And he goes, man, what do I know of these things of luck? The next day, the horse doesn't come back. It's gone. But a week later, the horse comes back with 50 other stallions and mustangs, wild horses. He's now rich in this Middle Eastern culture. He's got 50 horses, 50 horses. The neighbor comes over and he goes, wow. You've got great luck. He goes, well, what do I know of these things? What do I know of these things? The next week, his son is playing with, the, with one of the horses, the wild horses, and he gets kicked right in the knee. His little son breaks his knee right there. Boom. Now, in this culture, in, the, in, in you know, it's, uh, this is 2,000 years back, this kid might not ever walk again. He's going to be limp for the rest of his life, possibly. The neighbor comes over knowing that that is his precious son, knowing that he would trade those 50 horses for his legs, for his son's leg to be fine. Knowing that, he goes, man, you got bad luck. He goes, what do I know of these things of luck? Then a couple days later, a, gang, uh, a group of bandits and gangsters come by re- recruiting child soldiers for their little military expedition, and they go and they take the neighbor's son. And they look upon the other boy with the broken leg and they say, we can't take him. Well, he's not good for battle. And they don't take him. They leave him. And they take the neighbor's son and they go off. And when they go off, the neighbor comes over and he goes, man, you've got good luck. Your son's leg was broken and therefore they didn't take him. You see, why don't you wait? Why don't you wait till you are eventually glorified to question God on his goodness and in his power? The whole entire time, God was working out his perfection through all of these trials and these good gifts. It was all God's work in protecting his son. Why don't you wait to see what God's plan is the whole entire time? You may not know it right now. You may go through trials and not understand what God is doing. But why don't you wait till you get to see God for him to reveal what was good and what was evil? Why don't you wait and persevere and remain steadfast through all of this, knowing that it is his presence and it is his gift of salvation that is worth the most? Let's pray.